Welcome to our sixth presentation covering employees privacy and the management of personal information. I apologize for the premature end of our last video. Um, I lost my internet connection and so I will be picking up from the somewhat unusual place that I uh, stopped us when we were last together for our fifth lecture. Um, so I'm not going to do my intro review since uh, we didn't really make too much progress. Uh, we are now on slide 73 and we are talking about the topic of monitoring and we were talking about the various technologies that had um, affected that and one of course the big issues is that you know one of the things that we need to think about if we're the employer is why do we want to monitor and one of the big reasons that we do want to have monitoring sometimes is to uh, address productivity concerns are our folks being productive we may even have a schema in in place where the more productive the employee is the more money he or she earns and so obviously we'll have to have a way to, to categorize that and there's lots of very sophisticated systems out there let me give you an example when I was at uh, JC Penney there was very sophisticated uh, ways of, um, <clears throat> of deciding uh, an order picker um, how much credit he or she was going to get for a particular order and so um, order pickers in a catalog warehouse are almost running as they go from one place to another place um, and they walk miles a day as they're going down and picking this item and that item and some items are bigger than others some require reaching up high some require reaching it low and so um, it makes sense that various items give the employee more points or more credit based upon the difficulty in getting that item and so um, it's a pretty sophisticated uh, tool that kind of weights all of those different efforts and of course the orders are uh, arranged so that the order picker is um, doing all of the order picks from that particular row um, he doesn't go from you know row 17 to row 400 back to row 18 to row 297 um, they're arranged so that all the orders that he has on row 20 he's picking at one time and all the orders uh, items that he has on row 21 are picked at a different time and the items are routed to the various uh, packers the people who actually put the items in the boxes so that the items for a particular box um, are collected um, even though it may have been a variety of different order fillers who pulled the item so it's quite a dance in those warehouses to get everything coming out at the right time at the right place and ensure that the workers are properly acknowledged and rewarded for their efforts and so you can see in that system there needs to be a tremendous amount of monitoring both uh, to set up the standards to see well what can a worker do how, how what's a reasonable expectation and so the efforts of, of workers have to be monitored and then uh, values have to be put on various types of um, order filling or, or task completing and then that needs to be programmed into the system and so at the end of the day you have to have a tool that you can demonstrate to the worker hey this is what you did today and this is what you're going to be compensated for so productivity is definitely an interest and this is an interest for both the employer and the employee other interests though uh, certainly do exist one is to see if there's employee misconduct I mean let's say there were an order filler who um, instead of working his shift goes out and takes a smoke break um, outside of the normal time and so he is kind of a wall for 20 minutes outside of his normal break time well having a productivity monitor could show that he wasn't putting anything on the conveyor belt for that 20 minute period of time it can also be motivation not just figuring out how productive people are so that it can be measured it can motivate employees to be more, more productive uh, when employees see that they are paid more when they have more hustle they usually have more hustle it's a very strong incentive and so it can uh, result uh, in significant increase in productivity and generally employers want high productivity um, because a highly productive employee is usually less expensive than a low productivity employee 
And that even takes into account the fact that the high productivity employee is probably earning more. Uh, because there's just a lot of costs associated with having any employee. So if you can get more bang from that particular worker, you're going to have more of a profit. There may be issues about intellectual property protection or the concern that employees might be using uh, intellectual property incorrectly. They may be um, infringing upon a patent or a, uh, some kind of copyright and uh, so you want to make sure that they are following the rules. And so that might be one concern about monitoring. You may also be concerned about the security of your system. Are the employees allowing viruses or hackers to go in? Are they involved in hacking activity? Uh, the employees might be involved in uh, cyberbullying or other things on, in an online environment. Um, or perhaps they are beating up coworkers in the aisles of the, of the factory or whatever. And if you have cameras, you're able to um, you know, uh, monitor that and hopefully discourage it. And when it does happen, address it um, as quickly as possible. It can also help avoid morale issues. One of the concerns in a productivity-based job is that some workers who are working harder but aren't being compensated more get pretty upset about that. Um, and so that can be kind of a festering wound. But once they see, hey, wait a second, when I work more, I get more money, uh, that can address a lot of those issues. Avoidance of disruption. Uh, there's lots of things that can interrupt a, the productivity and so certainly monitoring it to see where the problems are and how it can be addressed can be a very helpful thing. Imagine that you have a conveyor belt and there's one tricky area in the conveyor belt that things seem to get hung up on. Well, if you have cameras or other monitor devices, you can figure out where that bottleneck is and address it. The first thing you need to know to solve a problem is what the problem is and, and how to go about resolving it. And there can be reputation related issues. Let me give you an example. When I was at JCPenney many, many years ago, there was a period of time when our stock price was quite low and um, there was a discussion board that was very popular. And um, it, a lot of the people on the discussion board seem to be um, uh, JCPenney employees. Uh, now, of course, none of the people would, would say, I'm a JCPenney employee, or sometimes they would say it, but they would um, you know, not give their full names or, or whatever. Anyway, well, what the, uh, the people in the headquarters, which uh, these people were called the home office, that was our, the term for the headquarters, um, they turned off access to this particular tool. And so nobody who was um, uh, at work logged into the um, internet in that particular place where it was able to connect to this particular website. They were able to see it, but they couldn't enter data. And as a result, this website went from having, you know, hundreds, of, or not maybe not hundreds, but but dozens and dozens of negative posts a day to having almost no <laughs> negative posts a day. It was pretty dramatic. The vast majority of the people that were saying not so nice things about JCPenney were working in its headquarters. And so by turning that function off, a lot of the bad publicity that was out there in the community about JCPenney stopped being created. Now, of course, these same workers had the capacity to go home or even to go out to lunch and do this, but most of them didn't, or at least they didn't do it as much. And so that was a smart strategy for reducing the bad publicity that the employer was getting. The employer, of course, could have tracked down who was making those posts and addressed them directly, even fired them. Uh, in this particular case, JCPenney chose not to do that, but uh, certainly that would have been a possibility. Um, as employers are kind of navigating this area, it's important that they consider um, what they're hoping to accomplish, what tools are most appropriate for accomplishing that, and to make sure that the employees are aware. Again, we're, we're going back to that reasonable expectation of privacy and we wanna make sure there is no reasonable expectation of privacy. Ideally, also, we wanna get employees buy-in to the extent that we can. I mean, no employee is probably ever going to be happy with being monitored. But if they understand why and they hopefully see some advantage for them in that activity, you can at least um, reduce the level of concern that employees have. As you can see in the corporate world, uh, monitoring of uh, various uh, uh, tools is very, very common. 
Um, and so uh, it's just something that an employee should expect. I'm not sure how clear that is to most corporate employees, but certainly people in HR and the legal department know that this is an extremely common thing. And honestly, it's just going to become more common. This is actually a rather dated post in 2008. These numbers have gotten higher, not smaller in the interim. Of course, when we're looking at employee email, we're looking at a balance between what the employer is hoping to accomplish versus uh, concerns about the employee's privacy. Now, this isn't so much of a legal concern. The employer is in the very good legal position, especially in Texas, to say, no, none of it's private. We're going to look whenever we want, however we want. But even though it's perfectly legal, it may not be a good business decision, one that's in keeping with the corporate culture that this particular employer wants to have. So it's a complicated issue involving not just legal analysis, but also um, corporate culture. Um, cases suggest there is no reasonable expectation of privacy when the employee is using um, the employer's equipment could be um, the uh, voicemail, it could be the computer or the laptop, it could be a company issued phone. All of those things are going to be considered uh, think because they belong to the employer, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. So it also apply to accounts that the employer is using. For example, the Wi-Fi. Even if the employee is using his or her own phone but is using the employer's Wi-Fi, again, there is no reasonable expectation of um, privacy. Um, let's consider this scenario. Mary is an employee of Elephant. She uses her um, office computer, so it's Elephant's computer, to check her personal email. Very common thing to do. Really nothing wrong with doing that in the vast majority of offices. Mary opens up one of her emails to find a link to a joke with a pornographic picture in it. Mary, I'm sorry, I have May here, but it should be Mary. Mary is reprimanded for violating the company's policy against accessing pornography. Mary has no cause of action against Elephant because, again, she had no reasonable expectation of privacy regarding her personal email because she was using the company's uh, computer and also very likely the company's um, internet access. So those point to the fact that you should be very, very careful even when you are in your private account and you as an HR professional or as a legal department professional need to be aware that um, this is uh, something that you may be asked to do. It's not a fun thing. Um, when I was at JCPenney, uh, one of my responsibilities was to look at reports in this area for our home office. And um, I had to see lots of really disturbing things. It was always amazing to me because JCPenney, virtually everyone in the organization has a cubicle. And the cubicles are only about five feet tall. So they were, these individuals were looking at all kinds of disturbing stuff in really a not a very private type of work environment. Um, anyway, uh, just be aware that, that that is something that happens all the time, uh, that people view things that are inappropriate all the time, and that the people who do that routinely get caught. And you shouldn't assume that just because you haven't been caught in the past, that some or another you're not going to be caught in the future. Technology is always progressing. Uh, an employer might have been more slack for a while and then decide to become more aggressive, and they don't necessarily make an announcement one way or the other. And so um, my suggestion to you would be, if there's any chance of this thing in your personal email that is inappropriate, wait until you're home or are off of the, uh, the work site before you uh, pull up that stuff. Now this fact that you don't have any, the employee doesn't have any reasonable expectation of privacy is going to be the case even if there are some ambiguous statements out there. Um, it's not unusual, unfortunately, for employers not to be very clear about this. And so there may be mixed messages about what's private, what's not, what can be searched, what can't be searched. Uh, when you're in HR or the legal department, you're not going to permit that. Of course, you're going to make sure that there's a consistent, reasonable policy in effect. But um, that's not the case for all corporate environments. And so when there's ambiguity, it's not good. It's not a smart thing. It's not fair really to the employee. And it's not smart for the employer. But even in those cases, there's a pretty good chance that the employee is still going to lack that reasonable expectation of privacy. This is a weird case. <laughs> um, I'm not even going to go into it because it's very strange facts, but the bottom line is uh, email sent uh, at work is just not going to be private under any definition.
Okay, so when you are, when you, let's assume for a second that you're in the HR department and you are working to develop computer use policies, how can this computer be used for what particular functions? Um, you want to make sure that your policies are written and that the information is shared with employees and that it is in fact followed by the company. It's pretty common for companies to send out an email once a year or twice a year that is a little reminder about the policies. It could be a screen that, uh, something that pops up um, on a particular day, maybe at the time of login or maybe at some other time, and that in order for the employee to proceed to whatever he or she is doing, the employee has to acknowledge it or click on it. Uh, probably most of the time the employee doesn't bother to read it, but uh, his click or her click has been recorded, and so that could become evidence to undermine the argument that he or she had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Also, other ways that this can be provided is certainly in written form or via email. It can be provided in an employee handbook or some kind of onboarding tool uh, that is used at the time of hire. So there's lots of different times and places that it can be done, but it should be done periodically to refresh. And that's especially important when there's changes to the policy, but even when there aren't changes to the policy, it's a good idea to refresh and remind folks about it. So you want to talk about uh, what is the appropriate coverage, what tools, what websites, what resources are being covered. And again, you're going to want this to be pretty broad if you're the employer, because if you leave something out, it's possible that a reasonable expectation of privacy about that particular thing might develop. You'll want to um, explain. And not in detail because the technologies might change, but in general terms how this data is going to be accessed and um, how it's going to be um, reviewed. You're going to want to collect only job relevant information. Uh, this can be tricky because um, Many times employees are going to use a particular device for mixed purposes. Uh, they use that office phone to talk to a customer and then two minutes later they're talking to their spouse. Well, it's perfectly appropriate for you to listen to the call when they're talking to their customer, but as soon as the call to the spouse starts and it's clear that it's not a customer, that it's a personal call, then that's when the monitoring has to go off. Uh, when it's an email message, um, it's really not the business of the employer to be concerned about the contents of the email message other than to confirm that it is in fact a personal correspondence. Now the way these actually work is that there's things called scrubbers out there and what these scrubbers are looking for usually are, are naughty words or I guess naughty pictures and so there will be certain words, I'm not going to share them with you, I bet you can figure out what the words might be that you would look for and so whenever these words pop up and you know it's a it's an estimation type thing. For example, if you happen to be in the business of designing or selling um, undergarments, some of these words might pop up just naturally as you're describing, well, you know, when we are designing this bra, we have to consider various cup sizes or things like that. So you might be using words that would pop up on that list. Obviously, some of the words on that list wouldn't be popping up in a professional conversation. But um, so, so sometimes the scrubber will identify emails that really are harmless um, and then obviously in this situation then the person who looks at the scrub list will say oh well that's not a bad thing no no worries there um, but then we'll go down to the ones that are more problematic most of the ones on the list in my experience are problematic and many times they are very much personal emails they've been developed or, or been found because of this whole scrubbing tool it's fine for employers to use these scrubbing tools to sort through and it's fine for the employer to be uh, 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 to exercise discipline when the employee is using the email perhaps for personal reasons but um, in ways that are bad for productivity and are bad for the reputation of the employer and so um, it's fine under those circumstances to look at personal email in, in that sense but certainly to look in personal emails that don't have a uh, pornographic or intellectual property infringing or um, uh, 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 inappropriate business uh, purpose um, those types of emails um, that are what we might call harmless those shouldn't be read and again the data should be used only for business interests not because you're curious about whether um, Bob is happy in his marriage or Louise is having problems with her 
children or whatever. So here are some ideas to consider when you're thinking about, you know, how you're going to uh, direct employees in terms of social media. One thing, again, you're going to want to periodically remind employees um, at least once a year and quite possibly more than one, one time a year. And you're going to want to include things like that we're going to do monitoring uh, to disclose uh, that, that this is going on and also to remind them about copyright uh, reminders that they can't. Uh, cut and paste things that are owned by someone else. Uh, so those are just some helpful things. Um, there are a few states that do have laws about employers handling of personnel records, but for the most part, uh, the employer's policies are what are going to control. Um, the uh, uh, state of Texas doesn't have any rules that require um, an employer to give an employee access to personnel files. Um, I think generally it's permitted um, by most smart employers to allow employees to have access to the personnel file. It's a good idea before you, you let the employee to have access to make sure that the personnel file is properly maintained, that the uh, health records are kept in a confidential separate envelope, and that anything that perhaps shouldn't have been put in the file has been scrubbed from the file. As a practical matter, there's typically lots of uh, various uh, personnel files that exist in large corporations today. I mean, there may well be, there probably is some kind of paper file. It could be in the supervisor's office, it could be in some kind of central location, but there will be lots of electronic files. For example, the email uh, records of this person, uh, the various health insurance data about this person. It could be historical um, HR documents that might be, have already been scanned and stored in a remote location. Um, various forms that the employee has entered electronically, for example, his or her employment application. Um, every time he or she has clicked an acknowledgement about the uh, a social media policy, all that stuff is going to be housed probably in a variety of servers. And so uh, the whole idea of a personnel file being kind of in one uh, credenza of one person's office is not really likely to be the case anymore. Um, so you have to think about that when, when an employee comes to you and says, I want to see my personnel file, you want to be clear to them, well, this is what we're going to show you. Um, unless we have a statutory requirement to do more, and again, we don't in Texas, um, you can kind of say what you're going to share with that person, and uh, you don't have to, uh, but, but what you don't want to say is, oh, we're going to show you everything, because you're not going to show them everything. There's a lot of stuff out there that would be real. I mean, honestly, there would be, you know, boxes and boxes of this, this data that potentially could be considered part of a personnel file. Uh, the employee really doesn't want to see all that. You don't want to have to produce it. Um, and so you want to be clear about what you're sharing um, in that context. Again, right now, Texas doesn't have any law in this area. There's no federal law that requires employers to give access to personnel files to employees. Um, but it's definitely something that an employer has to have a policy about. And uh, be sure that you follow that policy, whatever it might be, consistently. This is about the Federal Privacy Act. Again, this is about federal employees and how that information needs to be monitored. So let's consider a couple scenarios. Again, these are going to be gov federal government employees. So Mary is employed as a secretary for a federal government agency. Her supervisor insinuates that there are copies of her emails with negative references in her personnel file. Mary demands to see her personnel file, but her supervisor refuses to give her access. In this case, the supervisor has violated the Privacy Act because the Privacy Act does give federal employees the right to see their personnel file. And so that, that would even apply in Texas if, the, if Mary is working in Texas for a federal government um, agency. Let's consider our next scenario. Bob is a high-level employee with the U.S. Department of State. He found out that the department leaked confidential information about him without his consent. In this case, Bob can sue the Department of State as his rights have been violated according to the Privacy Act. Um, employers generally must allow union reps to see the personnel files of their members. So this, if, if, uh, if you um, are, if your workforce is unionized, then those um, uh, employees are entitled uh, and let, let, those employees in the bargaining unit, we'll talk about this more in a different module, kind of what a bargaining unit is and what the, that terminology means. But let's just 
work under the assumption that we've already kind of defined those terms. So you have this group of folks who have voted to be support to be represented by a union, and um, <clears throat> In Texas, many of those folks perhaps will have decided to join the union. And under those circumstances, the union does have the right to see um, those personnel files of their members. Um, it's a good idea, well, it's not a requirement, but it's a good idea to let employees know when an employer is going to share information from the personnel file to third parties. Sometimes this comes up in a subpoena scenario. Um, one, a, a, a task at JCPenney, we had somebody who's pretty much full-time job was just to respond to personnel record subpoenas. You know, Bob's in a car accident with Sally and uh, Bob wants to sue Sally or let, well, let's say Sally wants to sue Bob. And so uh, Bob is uh, developing his defense to the case and one of Sally's allegations is that she had to take off seven days from work to recover from her injuries. Well, Bob will want to see if that's true, if Sally really didn't work for those seven days and it, was she really even scheduled to work for those seven days and if, she, if it is true that she was scheduled and didn't work, exactly how many hours is she out as a result of that and what was her pay rate at that time? All of that is subpoenable information. Um, most employers, well, all employers are going to be required to provide that because it's going to be a subpoena, right? A subpoena means literally under penalty. The person receiving the subpoena is under the penalty of uh, contempt of court if the um, employer does not, uh, or excuse me, the, well, the, in this case, employer, but it could be someone else, does not comply with the subpoena. Um, uh, it, it is a best practice to let Sally, in this case, know that this particular information was uh, subpoenaed. Uh, but it's not a legal requirement, but certainly it, it is a, a good faith type thing to do. Now, the employer is not restricted and, and is not limited to provide this information only in subpoena situations, but it certainly is a best practice not to generally give out personnel records to third parties, you know, willy-nilly. Um, you don't want to give out any kind of medical information or any information that could put the employee in jeopardy. For example, let's say an employee is going through a divorce and he or she has moved to a different location, does not want his or her spouse to know where that new location is, perhaps because of domestic violence. Well, if you give that information to the, uh, the, the spouse, you can see how that could put the employee at risk. So you want to be careful about those types of situations. There can, in other states, be legal protections. Um, I would think under, in California, with the privacy rights associated with personnel files, the employer really can't share that information. So it's important to um, be aware of the, the state laws that are in play. And again, let, let's imagine that you're working for JCPenney or any large company. It's not so much the laws where the headquarters are that are relevant. It's going to be the laws where that particular employee works. So if you're Walmart, for example, you probably have a facility in all 50 states. And so you have to be familiar with the rules in all each one of those states to make sure that you're complying. Okay, let's talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have a separate module on this, but here's a little refresher on that. Um, in order to maintain a lawful personnel file on an employee, you really have to have two files. Your non-medical file, which has much less regulation associated with it, and then the confidential medical information. And that information has to be uh, kept separate from the general file. Um, for example, only medical information that is job-related and consistent with business necessity can be obtained from current employees. So you shouldn't be asking questions about employees that really aren't relevant. We've all been to doctors, and sometimes doctors ask all kinds of questions that really aren't relevant, you know. Uh, you know, were, were you, you know, you, I, I can think of times where my teenage children were, at, I was supposed to ask questions about, you know, whether they were uh, born premature or not. I'm like, well, gosh, I mean, <laughs> they're teenagers now. Who cares about that? But I mean, usually I go ahead and answer the question. You don't want to have those kinds of questions when you're talking from an employer to an employee. You want to think through, do I really need to know that information? Um, and if you have a reason, then it's appropriate to ask. But if it's just kind of nice to know, it's part of the form, let's just go ahead and ask. Better to err on the side of fewer questions rather than more questions. 
So once you've gathered that information, that may be a continuous process. For example, the employee comes in with a work restriction. His doctor has said that he can't lift over 25 pounds. Well, that's obviously something that people need to know about, so you're going to keep that form. But that's only in effect for a week, okay? Um, so uh, you can certainly keep that form. Uh, for for uh, for indefinitely, but you'll want to. Uh, it doesn't need to be something that's immediately available. Um, uh, a, you know, after that period of time has been uh, has expired. Uh, you might also have information about an employee because of a medical condition he has. For example, say an epileptic worker or a worker who has HIV. Uh, there may be specific medical instructions uh, to assist this employee when an event happens. And so that can be also important information to have. So you would want to treat that as confidential medical records and permit access only to people who need to know the information. So this is going to be managers and supervisors and first aid personnel who might be necessary to help treat that person or to accommodate that person. Not all supervisors or managers need to have that same information. Um, it really just needs to be the supervisors who interact with this particular employee. By the way, the mixing of these files can be an automatic basis for liability in the Americans with Disabilities Act and can result in fines, even if there's no other violations. Most of the time, it doesn't result in fines in and of itself, but it's a piece of evidence that this employer is not making good choices. Um, and so it typically kind of makes the EOC a little bit more suspicious about kind of, well, does the employer really have the good faith to comply with the ADA? And you don't want to be kind of a disadvantage in this situation. You want the EOC to see your employer as one who's making good choices, is interested and committed to complying with the law. I'm not going to talk about the OSHA rules. This is the Occupational Safe Safety and Health Act. It's a very technical set of statutes, uh, or st excuse me, not statutes, st set of regulations. Um, if you happen to work in an industrial situation where OSHA is a real concern, you'll need to get familiar with the rules. And, and so I'm not going to do more than just say there's lots and lots of technical rules in this area about how long you keep records, what type of records you keep, where you keep the records, when you have to notify the agency, the administrative uh, administration, OSHA, um, uh, the, the agency that is OSHA uh, when there's been uh, an issue that's come up. So it's a complicated uh, statute, statute schema for statute and also regulations. And so uh, just be aware that there's a lot to, to know about in that area. HIPAA. HIPAA is an interesting statute. Well, maybe the statute itself isn't so interesting, but it's what um, the popular culture has done. Um, for the most part, HIPAA is not a dangerous statute for employers, but employers think it is. It's the oddest thing. Um, there are lots of statutes out there that are much scarier for employers that employers don't worry about. But for whatever reason, HIPAA has captured the imagination of employers. Now, when I say it's not scary for employers, I don't mean that an employer can't violate it and there can't be consequences. But for the most part, it has to do with the insurers with the doctor's office and the insurance companies much more so than the employers. Now there can be exposure when the company is a self-insured company. So for example, uh, very large companies oftentimes really don't buy insurance from Blue Cross Blue Shield or United Healthcare, anything like that. These um, uh, insurance companies are actually just working as administrators of the program. Um, it's really at the end of the day coming out of the large corporation's piggy bank. The large corporation, in other words, is not paying um, premiums. They're paying a management fee. And so they actually pay out the actual uh, uh, costs of, of whatever medical services that the employees employees might need. So if the if you're if you're a very large company and you're self-insured, there is some heightened risk. But for the most part, it's going to be the Blue Cross Blue Shields and the doctor's offices who have to be especially concerned about HIPAA. Now, of course, if you work for one of those entities, then yes, HIPAA should be a very significant concern for you. One thing that comes up is that it's pretty often, especially when we're talking about a disability or workers' compensation claim, where an employer will go to the doctor that is treating the particular employee and say, we want XYZ records. 
And many times the impression that one will get, the incorrect impression, frankly, is that the employer can't ask. The employer can ask. The, the, the doctor's office should say no, unless, of course, the employee has provided a release. But it's, the problem isn't asking. It, the problem is when the doctor's office provides the documentation. The doctor's office is in violation. The employer isn't in violation. Now, this does, I'm not suggesting that employers ought to go around asking for things that they don't have an entitlement to. But just keep in mind that at the end of the day, it's much more risky for the doctor's office or the health care provider than it is for the employer in these areas. Um, HIPAA does prohibit employers from using protected health information and making employment decisions without prior consent of the employee. So if an employer gets some information, uh, perhaps this, this worker, uh, the employer hears that this worker has a particular uh, weight restriction because of some injury that the person has um, experienced. And so now the employer wants to transfer this employee to a different a shift or a different department or a different job responsibility. Well, there needs to be prior conversations with the employee. Now, it doesn't mean that the employee is going to be in a position to say, well, no, I don't choose that particular assignment. I want this other assignment. Um, but still, uh, the employee has to be given, has to give the employer permission to, to actually act on that information from the doctor. And if the employee says, no, I don't, I don't want to follow that 25-pound weight restriction, generally speaking, the employer should ignore it because the employee is saying that I'm, I'm not choosing that level of treatment from my physician. Video surveillance. In general, employers can uh, use video cameras on their employees without significant legal concerns, especially when it's obvious. We had that case earlier where the Puerto Rican phone company was recording its workers as the workers worked in desks uh, doing various and sundry tasks. And we recall that it was there was no reasonable expectation of privacy under those circumstances because all the workers could see the cameras. They knew exactly what was going on. So since there was no reasonable expectation of privacy, their, their reasonable expectation of privacy couldn't have been violated. Now, a surreptitious video recording is much more likely to be problematic. And certainly, you don't want to have video cameras in bathrooms or lockers or uh, places where people have a, a reasonable expectation of privacy. Another area that you want to be careful about is if there's a union organizing campaign going on. Many times when there's a union organizing campaign, there will be uh, places wherein um, sometimes it's workers, sometimes it's union organizers will be uh, putting up signs or distributing literature. And what you don't want to have in that situation is having cameras present. That, for example, the cameras might show who is taking the literature, who is declining the literature, who's distributing the literature, maybe even seeing what the literature says, if you can kind of zoom in on the pictures. That's pretty uh, legally risky. If you already have cameras up in the air, it's, it's a good idea to turn off those cameras and perhaps to even take them down during the process of the union organizing campaign. If you do somehow or another inadvertently record, you want to erase it, you don't want to look at it. Um, this is because, uh, we'll talk about this more, there's a, a term that we have in the law called tips for this. You cannot survey or monitor people involved in union organizing uh, activities. And again, we'll talk about this later in another module. You want to, um, if you're using the video monitoring, you want to let employees know that they are subject to it. And you will want, but you don't have to let them know that you have the cameras up this very second. I mean, it, you may put the cameras in response to an employee theft concern. Well, you don't want to go and tell everyone right then, hey, look, we just put up the cameras because we think there's some stuff going on. Because guess what? The thief won't steal then. So what you want to have is an, a uh, statement, periodic statement saying, sometimes we use video cameras. And so we're not telling you when we're going to use it. We're not telling you how we're going to use it. We're not telling you where we're going to use it. We won't use it in bathrooms. We won't use it in uh, the, the, the locker rooms. But we, won't, we will potentially use it in other places. So that notice is going to be relatively vague. And then you pop in and use the, the cameras when the particular issue comes up um, to address whatever that issue might be. Um, we uh, talked earlier about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. 
And one of the terms that we have in that statute, which is a little tricky, is the concept of intercepting. Um, intercepting means capturing the communication at the exact second it's being sent. So it goes to the recipient and it also goes to somebody else. It like, almost like divides at that point. Um, interceptions are legal if um, there is consent and the consent of course can be implied because the employee is consenting to be there at work and is consenting to be working for this employer so generally there isn't a legal problem with intercepting um, uh, the uh, stuff of your particular employee while he is at work a uh, communication service providers are exempt so again, this is when the service provider, the, for example, the server where the um, um, messages are stored or the uh, person, the, the entity that's providing the, the Wi-Fi or the internet, um, they can't be guilty of intercepting because it was intended to come to this company. I mean, that was kind of the whole point. And so an employer certainly can search an employee's stored emails in its own system that's not going to be a violation. Uh, so the issue of whether it was intercept or not again becomes moot because uh, it's actually in the employer's possession. Business users of the uh, provider's equipment are exempt if the equipment is used in the ordinary course of business. So for example, an employer can install additional extension phones to listen in on employees' business calls. Um, this is a pretty common thing that happens, uh, for example, in call centers. So I'm on the, the, the phone, uh, and it's probably not a traditional phone, it's probably some kind of headset situation I have, and maybe I'm taking orders. So people call in and they want to order, you know, uh, something through a catalog or some other or maybe they're calling for a customer service issue and so I'm assisting them well someone may be listening in on the call who is making sure that um, I'm saying what I'm supposed to say I'm saying it in a polite way I'm answering the question I'm moving the call along as quickly as I can whatever those things are that I'm supposed to do under these circumstances so someone could be listening live or they could be taping it either way um, it's not a problem to use um, these extensions, these listening in tools, uh, when it is part of the business of the, uh, the company. Now again, if I flip to that personal call, then the uh, employer needs to get off the call as soon as it realizes, oh, wait a second, this isn't a customer. Now let's say I'm not supposed to take personal calls at work. Uh, let's say there's a rule about that. Well, the employer has identified that I'm actually making a personal call. The employer has to disconnect at that time as soon as that becomes obvious. But the employer is perfectly within its rights to fire me for misusing the, my, my time at work and, and, it's, and the employer's telephone system. So it's not that discipline can't happen. It's just that what the, the particulars of what I'm saying um, is not something that the employer is entitled to hear about. Overall, employees should assume that their emails and other electronic communications will be read by their employer. So, um, it, text messages, things like that, because again, those are also going through uh, the data. Conduct investigations professionally. Um, make sure that the people conducting them are um, acting prudently, are using good judgment, are documenting what they did, where they looked, where they didn't look. Also consider, is this person or people who are conducting the investigation, are they going to be good witnesses? Are they the type of people who are going to present well in front of a jury? Um, so if this becomes a matter in, of, of a controversy. So think about putting forth people who have a credible demeanor, who can be pleasant and can be professional, who are likely to be believed. We've talked in the past about how workplace searches when the, work, when the workplace is a government place has to satisfy the Fourth Amendment. We talked about um, also how workplace searches can cause issues with respect to privacy torts such as intrusion upon seclusion. Again, those kick in when there is not a, when there is a, I mean the concern about the tort kicks in when there is in fact a reasonable expectation of privacy. If that doesn't exist, then there isn't any uh, uh, tort that can develop.
Obviously, the best course of action is to obtain consent. And most of the time, the employee will agree to it. Uh, Bob, we need to check your computer. Is that okay with you? I mean, if he says no, he knows he's going to get fired, right? Um, and in a way, that solves your problem too. So you say, do you consent? He says, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Bob, but this is an employment decision. If you say no, then you know, we're going to have to let you go. Oh, okay, I guess you can look. Okay, so now he's given his consent. Now you might say, well, his consent is coerced. I mean, he didn't really want to give his consent. He just didn't want the consequence. Uh, consent doesn't have to be without strings. Uh, life involves making choices, and sometimes the choices, are, you don't like either one of the choices, but once you give consent, you've given consent. So employment actions by private employers do not trigger constitutional protections, again, because the Constitution is about protecting citizens and residents from the government, not from multinational corporations. So for the private scenario, we're not worried about the Fourth Amendment, we're much more worried about the privacy torts and uh, some statutes. So when you're conducting searches of workplaces, you want to think about doing it in a reasonable manner. You don't want to search places you don't need to search. For example, if you think something is on somebody's computer, you don't need to search their desk drawers. You don't want to destroy the employee's property. You don't need to rip through their calendar um, or um, uh, jimmy open their, their private lock unless there's a need to do so. And of course, it shouldn't be discriminatory. You should not be uh, singling out either consciously or unconsciously a particular group, either a racial group or a religious group or an ethnic group, anything along those lines. Let me pause and talk about workplace searches that um, are uh, can be very, very sensitive. And this is one that the textbook I don't think talks about. And yet this is definitely an area of concern. Um, some, especially if you have a large workforce, probably it's going to come up at some point that one of your workers has um, something on his or her computer that could qualify as child pornography, uh, where the individuals that are pictured seem to be under the age of 18 and they're engaged in sexual behavior or they are not fully clothed in a, in a sex, in a, in a, for a sexual kind of gratification situation. When this happens, it's really, really important that you act immediately to preserve the data and most and most likely you're going to call the FBI immediately. Uh, you certainly can call the law enforcement, uh, local law enforcement as well. I would also suggest that you get the legal department involved. Literally time is of the essence. You don't want to sit on that for even 24 hours before you let the FBI or, or whomever uh, your legal counsel recommends. This is a big deal issue um, and so you need to act very, very responsibly under those circumstances if that information comes to your attention. So as it might come to your attention through a routine check, you're not looking for child pornography, but you come across it. Another scenario could be that um, you get a tip, somebody saying, hey, such and such, I think is looking at pictures of kids that are just wrong. And so, um, you know, you may become aware of it because there is a concern about the possibility of child pornography. Okay, so let's talk about a scenario here. Flyers are handed out, some kind of, kind of brochures handed out at a local shopping mall that denigrates an employer. The employer has its security force search all of its employees' lockers to see whether they had any of the flyers. Bob, one of the employees, is infuriated by his employer's action. In this case, Bob can file an action against his employer under the Fourth Amendment if the employer is a state or local government. You may recall that Kmart v. Trotty case that we talked about earlier, that Texas case in which the employer did search the locked lockers of the employees to see if there were stolen items in there. And the, um, the employee in this case, number one, was not guilty of theft, and number two, sued for invasion of privacy. So even in when the, when the employer is not a governmental employee, under these circumstances, it could well be um, a, a tort claim that could arise under these circumstances. Now, of course, if the employer had a very clearly stated policy that it was going to uh, periodically search lockers, if it controlled the key or the combination to the lockers, if it um, had done those actions, then it would be in a much better place to open those lockers than if it hadn't established those precedents. 
you know, you establish the presence because you're just not sure what's going to come down the, the pike. I mean, the employer probably wasn't expecting that there'd be these flyers distributed. It, if it had had a crystal ball and knew that was coming, then it would have been able to alert its workers. But it didn't know, and it didn't plan ahead. And so now it's in a situation where the employees might have a reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to their locker, and the employer therefore really shouldn't go into those lockers without the consent of the employees. Now, how can that be obtained? I mean, it's pretty easy. As, as employees go to their lockers, or you can even call them from the, um, uh, the floor, let's say it's a retail establishment from the floor and say, listen, Bob, um, you have a locker here, locker 17. Um, do you consent to open it to let us see what's inside? Uh, yes, I do consent. Okay, then we look, look inside, that's fine. Or Bob says, no, I don't consent. Well, Bob, if you don't consent, then we're not going to be able to continue to use your services. This will be your last day of work. What? You're going to fire me? Yes, Bob, unless you consent. Uh, well, I guess I do a consent. Okay, Bob, let's look. And so that's a consent. So you can handle it that way um, if you would like to. Um, uh, if you have not already established that there is no reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to the locker. Poorly performed interrogations do have great potential for causing problems, uh, oftentimes in the false imprisonment area. Many times this comes up when there is some kind of theft investigation and the people conducting the investigation really have no idea how to go about it. And so they kind of decide that they're going to pressure the person, you know, lock them in a room or, um, uh, you know, kind of browbeat them in, in such a way that the, the person is very, very intimidated. Uh, this is not good practice at all, and it can result possibly in criminal charges against the person who is limiting uh, the movements of this person accused, even if the person is guilty or innocent for that matter. Um, this is a situation, potentially a false imprisonment, and it can be a civil matter, a tort, or it can actually be a criminal matter. It can be, you know, essentially kidnapping, so to speak. And so uh, one should not get involved in going down this road and, unless and until one is pretty sophisticated and trained in, in, in how these laws um, are actually interpreted in your particular state. So what is a false imprisonment? It's a total restraint on freedom to move, the move, to move against the employee's will, such as keeping an employee in one area of an office. Um, this a false imprisonment can arise, though, even if there are no locked doors, if it is just um, a very intimidating situation. So let's say you've decided to interview an employee. Maybe you think the employee is guilty of some type of theft. Are you required to let them have an attorney or family member present? Uh, no, you aren't required to do that. This isn't the police. You, this person doesn't have rights against self-incrimination because, again, we're not the government. Now, of course, if you are the government, that's a different scenario. If you, so if it's a governmental employee situation, the answers will be different. If the employee is a minor under 18, you want to make sure that the company has considered how to handle those situations. Many employers choose to allow the employee in that situation to contact a parent to handle that issue. Uh, again, there's a variety of, of uh, techniques for these concerns and you just want to make sure you have a resolution or an answer to that before the actual situation arises. Okay, let's talk about wine garden. Let's first of all talk about when you have a unionized environment. So this is a the union, it has a role in this place. And so you are interviewing an employee who is associated with this bargaining unit. And this employee does have a right when he or she is being questioned in a potentially disciplinary situation to have a union representative present. Oftentimes this will be a union steward if the union steward is available or it could be some other a member of the bargaining unit who's kind of there to um, be another set of ears so that you know, there's some kind of equality there because probably the employer is going to have two people or more there. So it kind of levels up the playing field, so to speak, to have the employee have a, an ally there as well. Um, we call this a wine garden ride because there was a, a U.S. Supreme Court case called wine garden. Or at least that was one of the parties. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said that unionized employees do have this right. Um, 
it, there was a period of time in the late 90s, early 2000s, wherein non-unionized employees also had the right to assert these kind of quasi wine garden rights. Obviously, they didn't have a union steward because there was no union, but they could uh, request that a coworker be present if discipline was a possibility. Um, that is not currently the law, but that could change. Another president could come in, and uh, a Democratic president, for example, and might want to restore wine garden rights um, to non-unionized individuals. If you happen to work in a unionized facility, it's pretty common for um, un members of the union to have something called a wine garden card. And so they'll pull it out when they're going to be taken to a disciplinary meeting, and they will actually read off of it, and it'll say something like, because I think this might be a disciplinary meeting, I request to assert my wine garden rights and I would like to contact my union steward or something like that. So that's something to be prepared for if you happen to be working in that environment. Be aware that, again, wine garden rights could extend to a larger portion of the population. Right now they don't, but that's a good thing as an HR professional to be aware can happen. Let's consider this scenario. So in this scenario, Bob works for um, a governmental agency in the accounting department. Larry's the head of the department. He storms into Bob's office demanding to search the files and all records of payments made by the department to this particular company. Bob attempts to leave the office during the search, but Larry blocks the way, okay, and asks him to stay until the review of all files is complete. Now, you can hear from the story, I mean, Larry isn't locking Bob into the room. I mean, Bob isn't literally stopped from escaping, but he's intimidated into not escape, escaping. So um, under these circumstances, Bob probably can have a claim for false imprisonment. Uh, so you have to be very careful about restricting Bob's movements um, under these circumstances. That would apply whether it's a governmental position or a private sector position. Let's talk about polygraphs. The, my, my main piece of advice about polygraphs in the workforce is just don't. Just don't. They are a huge trap for employers. There's very little positive that can come from polygraph tests for a private sector employer. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity for really awful, terrible things to happen to the employer. So the answer is just don't. But if for some reason you aren't persuaded by my just don't, let's walk through a few of the reasons why just don't is the best answer. And it really turns on this particular statute, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act. It greatly, greatly, greatly restricts an employer's ability to polygraph employees. Um, it makes almost all employment uh, polygraph tests by a private sector employers unlawful and the damages can be huge. Um, as a result of these very significant limitations and the risks of messing up, most sophisticated employers just never ever use it. Uh, let me, but let's go through some times where an employer can use it if an employer is really brave or maybe a little foolhardy and then we'll talk through other strategies that an employer can use that might be better than polygraphs. Before we go down polygraphs too far, let me just say the reason that the federal government has the statutes is that polygraphs are pretty darn close to junk science. Um, they really turn upon the uh, uh, skill level of the polygraphist. Uh, Poly polygraphist, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, the person conducting the polygraph. If the person isn't skillful, it's a crapshoot whether you, that person can tell. It's, it's a 50-50 thing. N no better than, you know, burning somebody at the stake or, you know, <laughs> what all the other tests that people used to do back in the Middle Ages. Um, even really good polygraphers are, you know, better than than dumb luck but still they oftentimes will result in inaccurate results uh, the more sophisticated the employee it, this will say the employee who wants to lie is the more likely he or she will get away with it there are lots of tricks and things that can be done that are very possible to thwart the polygraph results um, an unsophisticated person is less likely to be able to trick the system, but um, 
a sophisticated person very possibly can. So the bottom line is, even if you use a polygraph, I mean, you should approach it as this is just one piece of pretty suspicious, not very credible evidence, but it should not be the linchpin in your case. Also, people who are telling the truth can come up as liars because guess what? Being polygraphed is really, really intimidating. I mean, of course you're going to be sweating buckets, even if you're completely innocent because it's really, really scary process. So the, the bottom line is you don't want to do it because there's very few uh, situations in which you can. If you mess up, it's, it's unlawful. And number three, it's pretty much junk science. But let's talk about the circumstances in which you can technically use the polygraph process if you're a private employer. One is if you are engaged in an ongoing investigation of, for ec of economic loss or injury. So you can't use it in a sexual harassment case. You can't use it to decide which employee to promote because you want to only promote the most honest employee or something like that. It, it can only be when you're investigating something involving economic loss. So example, theft. The particular employee must have had access to the property that is subject to the investigation. So you can only um, give a polygraph to the people who might have done it. You can't polygraph people who might have heard something or might have observed something, but definitely were not guilty. So you're restricted just to the potential guilty people. The employer must have a reasonable suspicion based upon facts in addition to access that this particular employee was involved. And obviously you can't consider uh, things like race and national origin and things like that in determining who might be more likely to have engaged in this behavior. Finally, the employer must provide the employee with written notification before the administration of the test. So there's a lot, so there's very limited circumstance in which you can use the polygraph, and we'll see it's even limited more than this as we go to future slides, okay? During the exam, employees must not be asked questions designed to degrade or needlessly intrude on their privacy. It's pretty common in effective polygraph tests that you do ask some questions designed to make the witness uncomfortable. Uh, the, the polygrapher wants to ask some questions to see a whole range of emotions, so he or she has a measurement. So he or she might ask you questions that would be embarrassing. Um, and he will also ask you questions that he expects you will lie about. Um, and that way he will know well, that this is the reaction this person has to a lie. Well, much of the ability of the polygrapher to be effective in, in giving good results is going to be undercut by this. Also, the polygrapher can ask questions relating to religious beliefs, opinions about racial matters, political beliefs, sexual behavior, or beliefs or activities regarding the labor organization. Again, these are oftentimes the issues that allow the polygrapher to really see that range of emotion. When a person is embarrassed or put in an uncomfortable position, how do the numbers look in terms of their respiration, their pulse, things like that? Well, you're taking away a lot of the arsenal of tools that the polygrapher has to, de to deliver reliable results. But this is the one that crushes it. This is the one that makes the test pretty useless. You have to have the um, employee review all the questions beforehand. So there's no element of surprise. The employee knows he's going to be asked these 40 questions or whatever. And so any emotional reaction that he might have had to them that might have been an indication that, ah, oh, yes, we've caught him in a lie, is completely diffused because he's already seen all the questions and he's had time to compose how he's going to respond to it. So again, even if you have a great polygrapher, boy, this has really undermined the, the results of the test. Um, so those are the reasons why you really don't want to have a polygraph. So even when an investigation which the use of a polygraph is legally appropriate, submission to a polygraph cannot be required or made a condition of an employment. And an employee cannot be disciplined or discharged for failure to submit. So even if you can set up the polygraph, you can't make the employees submit to it. And if an employee says, I'm not going to submit to it, you can't fire him for that. You can't even invite the police to come in to do a polygraph. Or you can't send your employees down to the police station to get polygraph. Let's say the police department is conducting its own investigation. Um, so you can't even kind of partner up with the police under these circumstances. Now we can see the fines can be huge, $10,000 per occurrence. 
I mean, that employee has to have stolen a lot of stuff to make $10,000 uh, an acceptable risk for you in terms of fines. The act's prohibitions do not apply, though, to federal, state, or local government employees or to employees of federal government contractors dealing with defense and intelligence agencies. So there are some important exceptions. If you fit into these, then certainly you have more flexibility about the polygraph. Again, though, it's junk science. It's probably better not to use it, even if you don't face the prospects of these types of, uh, of results. Okay, so let's say you've decided not to use a polygraph. Well, what should you do under those situations? What's the plan B? Let's say you have three employees. We'll call them Ed, Bob, and Mary. They are the only three people who had access, and we'll say that $300 is missing from the till. Um, so you want, you've uh, interviewed all three of them. Each one of them says, oh, wasn't me. Couldn't have been me. Had it been somebody else. And you just can't tell which one of them is more likely to be responsible for it. Uh, they all seemed equally credible or equally incredible, depending upon the circumstances. Um, so what can you do? You're not going to do the polygraph. Um, well, one choice you have is fire all three. You might say, but I'm sure only one of them is guilty. I mean, I'm, I'm just really sure they did not work together. That's okay, because they're employed at will. You can fire all three, even if you're, you're persuaded that, you're only, that two of them are completely innocent and only one is guilty. Now, the risk here that you want to work on is that you don't want to um, uh, defame these individuals by saying, oh, yeah, we fired Bob because he stole. Well, no, you're not really firing because he stole. You're firing because he's an at-will employee and you have the legal right to do so. Um, so you don't want to, if somebody calls for a reference check, number one, you, you have a neutral reference policy, hopefully, and so you don't provide any that information. But even if you don't have a neutral reference policy, you don't want to say, well, we fired Bob because we thought he was stealing. No, you didn't think that. You thought it was a possibility. But I wouldn't even mention that possibility. I would just say we decided to part company with Bob, and I'm not going to provide any more details. That's the safe way under those circumstances. Now, I will tell you, let's say that you fire all three, even though you really have no idea which one actually did it. Are you going to win the unemployment case? No, you aren't going to win the un unemployment case because uh, there's only a one in three chance that Mary did. There's only a one in three chance Bob did. There's only a one in three chance Ed did it. And under those circumstances, you don't have sufficient evidence to support the termination. You, they are going to be awarded unemployment benefits. Uh, but it may be a small price to pay to get rid of the thief uh, to have to also sacrifice two good workers. So that is a strategy that is perfectly lawful. It may be unpalatable. You might think, gosh, that seems so cold and mean to the other two people. Well, I mean, that's unfortunately sometimes the the choices that an employer has to make alternatively the employer can put up cameras and take additional measures to hopefully either catch which one of them is guilty or motivate whoever the guilty one is to not engage in that behavior going forward let's consider this scenario mary works for kangaroo boutique who's in which is owned by lucy one day lucy escorts mary to a back room where mary is given a polygraph test related to a recent allegation of sexual harassment. Mary tries to leave, but Lucy insists that Mary stay and submit to the test. It's determined that Mary had nothing to do with the harassment. In this case, Mary has a legal recourse against uh, kangaroo boutique because the use of the polygraph under these circumstances is a uh, violated federal law because it doesn't satisfy um, that there was an, an ongoing investigation of economic loss or injury and that there was no property that is the subject of the investigation. So uh, another problem probably in this case would be uh, the fact that um, um, Mary tries to leave and Lucy insists that, she, that Mary stay and submit to the test. So it sounds like there might also be a false imprisonment claim that Mary can advance. And most of the time when a plaintiff goes to visit the attorney and the attorney takes the case, you're not going to get just one theory. You're going to get several theories. So you're probably going to have a, a polygraph violation, a false imprisonment uh, scenario, and there may well be some others stacked on top of this. So not a happy position for Lucy to be in. Um, let's say Lucy decides, or let's go back to our scenario with um, 
Ed, Bob, and Mary. Let's say that we decide we're going to, since we can't decide which one of them is guilty, we're going to refer the matter to the police against all three, even though we really only think one of them did it. So we, we're, we're persuaded there's less than a 50% chance that any one of these people actually committed the crime. But we file a police report and the police pursue it. Well, this would be a situation in which malicious prosecution could be a claim that could be lev levied against us, a civil a claim, a, a tort claim. This would occur when criminal claims are initiated against an innocent party. So if Mary, for example, is actually innocent of the theft, but we still press criminal charges against her, now Mary, let's say she uh, is exonerated in the criminal case, she can file a tort alleging malicious prosecution and, again, potentially advance her tort claim. So that's why you don't want to uh, pre present a, a uh, criminal charges or, or, or file criminal charges against a party unless you are pretty confident that that entity or that person is guilty of the crime. Doesn't I mean you don't have to have the smoking gun, but you need to have pretty darn strong evidence. And you want to make sure that you keep that evidence um, so that you can not only uh, use it in the criminal case, but also use it in the event that that particular employee decides to uh, file a tort of malicious prosecution. So now we've completed this uh, presentation. We talked, we gave an overview of employment privacy, employee privacy. We talked about the reasonable expectation of privacy, and we talked about how that is really important to all of the other areas. We talked about this is an objective standard. It's not how one person perceives privacy, but how kind of the average in our society it would be perceived. We talked about the constitutional issues which relate to governmental employee. We talked about the statutory issues. Some of the statutes just relate to government employees. Some of the statutes apply to all employees. We talked about the common law issues. This of course is probably the most important category here and it's primarily focused upon private sector employees. We talked about special situations such as off-duty activities that employees might engage in and the employee's use of personal property as well as we talked about drug and alcohol testing. Finally, we talked about employee monitoring, the telephone and email use as well as computer use. We talked about uh, in medical records that the, that the employer has that relate to the employee. We talked about investigation protocols and finally we talked about polygraphing. So hopefully this presentation has been helpful for you. Let's just go over a couple of tips that might be uh, good things to leave with as we finish up this uh, presentation. Uh, be sure that you develop and maintain policies to reduce and define employees' reasonable expectation of privacy. Keyword here is reduce. You don't want them to have that in the workplace. It's not helpful for you as the employer. You want to make sure that when you gather data, you are using it for defined uh, business purposes and that it is consistent with the policies that you have. If for some reason you decide to change the way you, and you gather and protect and maintain it, you'll want to change your policies. So um, hopefully this presentation has been helpful. As always, please reach out to me if there are some things that you'd like to chat about in more detail or something that seemed confusing to you. I'd be glad to provide a little bit more clarity or information. My email is cgroover at colin.edu. I look forward to hearing from you. Alternatively, please stop by and see me. I'd be delighted to talk in more detail about any of these topics. Thanks so much for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care.